Okay, I can do this one. Okay. Um, so seeing kind of mixed inflammation, um, looks like almost like little cannonballs in the lobules of the fat and then yep. some septal inflammation and fibrosis as well. Um, but with the organization of all the inflam, thinking more of uh, like a nodular vasculitis. Good. Yeah. I think this is one of these things that I have thought of multiple times. I've raised it in the differential diagnosis in my report multiple times. I don't know that I've ever seen a bona fide definitive example of this in real life. So nodular vasculitis, which is also known as erythema endurotum. So the question is, well, nodular vasculitis, where's the vasculitis? So that's the problem with this is sometimes you see it with vascular damage and vasculitis. Probably this is kind of a bit of that right here. This probably is a dead damaged vessel. You can see the red cells in the middle and there's necrosis with some neutrophils around the obliterated wall of the vessel surrounded by a granuloma, big, nice granuloma with a necrotizing center. So really though, it really depends if you think that's a vessel or not. You could call this a necrotizing granuloma or you could say maybe it's granulomatous necrotizing vasculitis it's sometimes hard to decide which thing is the primary thing here. So the way I think of it is if I see granulomatous stuff with a lot of necrosis and anything that suggests possible vascular damage, I number one, I want to make sure it's not infectious, right? We got granulomas with necrosis, infection, infection, infection. We got to rule that out. Number two, I want to think of weird vasculitis, and that would include nodular vasculitis, like ure urethema endurotum, the other name for that. And it would also include things like uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly known as Wegner's, right? And an anca associated vasculitis and some other weird and unusual uh, things too can come in the differential. If you had, uh, you know, here we have nice necrosis and some neutrophils, but some areas here, we've got very tight, non-necrotic, tuberculoid or sarcoidal type granulomas that have very minimal inflammation. They're naked, tight granulomas. Those to me look perfect for sarcoidosis, right? And we can have a form of sarcoidosis that involves a subcute. It's called Derrier Roussy, which is subcutaneous sarcoid. And also I've seen beautiful sarcoidal granulomas also in foreign body granulomas sometimes. So polarize this to make sure there's no foreign material. Do bug stains to make sure it's not infection. If you've ruled all that out, then I'm going to tell you, go do a workup for systemic vasculitis, including ANCA, and maybe consider testing for what? What causes nodular vasculitis erythema endurotum? What is the, the cause of it? Or what is it, you know, uh, what's making this happen? It's usually TB. Right, but TB where? Not here, right? TB somewhere else in the body, which is weird. So this is considered or thought to be a so-called tuberculid. And the these are always kind of blew my mind. The idea being that this is a process that's driven, it's driven by tuberculosis infection elsewhere in the body. And I guess the idea is that somehow those antigens from the TB bacteria circulate in the body and for some reason cause inflammatory reaction elsewhere in the body where the organisms are not actually there. So it's some immune response driven by that. And we can see other id type reactions right? Like the classic id being like this spongiotic and perivascular and edematous eruption that you get where you have fungus on your feet and then you get this inflammatory uh, eruption on the arms or, the, or elsewhere that are driven by the immune response related to the fungal infection on the feet. That blew my mind when I first heard about id eruption or id reaction and tuberculids blow my mind too. So it's the immune system is like revved up and turned on by the TB elsewhere and it begins making granulomas plus minus vascular damage elsewhere in the body. So telling them to, you know, check the patient with maybe quantifier on gold or some other similar test to see if they might have uh, lab signs of active TB, uh, potentially do a chest x-ray, if clinically appropriate, all those things. So the reason I'm bringing all this up, these paniculitis cases, we didn't really delve into the the uh, the philosophy of it, but they're hard. I find these often really challenging uh, because they don't always neatly fit into boxes. And oftentimes the differential is broad. And oftentimes I'm left with saying, well, I don't see infection, but but you might want a culture to make sure it's not infection. And you might want to do uh, X, Y, Z on a laundry list of different things to try to figure out the case, which is kind of frustrating and unsatisfying because we often don't find out what the actual answer is unless someone goes back and gives me follow-up. All right. So anyway, I think it's an important thing to think of these necrotizing or some people say caseating granulomas. That's a bit of a misnomer. It's more of a gross description. But in any case, necrotizing granulomas, uh, you have to exclude infection here. But if you've ruled out infection here, I would still want cultures done here. Then I would say do quantifieron. And, and check the patient for TB and also check them for ANCA while you're at it probably. Because ANCA, one of my mentors, uh, Phil Cagle, 
uh, who's a lung pathologist, he told me once that, you know, that uh, I think there was a case that he had been using in a study set as like a good example of granulomatosis with polyangitis Wegner's and ended up the patient ended up later, they found out they had TB or else it was vice versa. But he was bringing up the, and I love that he told me that story because the point was, is that even for an experienced lung pathologist, TB and, and Wegner's can look so similar sometimes that you could, you could really confuse them. So I thought that was a really important pearl that I've always carried with me that, that, that disease can, sometimes they have vasculitis, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you get a lot of granulomas, sometimes not as much. So uh, it's important important to keep that in mind. Okay, great. Um, next case. Oh, and the, oh, the last thing I did want to say, I, I like that you pointed out that erythema endoratum is, it, it has both lobule, the fat lobules are involved and there's septal involvement. So it's classically, people often like to split paniculitis into, is it septal or is it lobular or both? And I think endoratum it, uh, comes into the, the both category uh, where it's both the septa are widened and inflamed and thickened and fibrotic and there's lobular involvement with the granulomas. Whereas erythema nodosum is the classic septal only. But honestly, I would say erythema nodosum, that's really helpful because it is usually septal predominant. Pretty much all the other paniculitis are kind of a mixed bag, and I don't personally find the lobular versus septal to be really that helpful, with the exception of enodosum, which really is septal. But everything else, I feel like it doesn't really help me that much. If you find it helpful for you, though, use that, okay? All right, now 10.